True religion is the inner light above all else. Virtue is a fine thing. Its name really means force, power. Virtue presupposes action, for the reason why is usually contrasted with our passions. It's to make it clear that it is never something passive. Not only is virtue strength, it is the governing reason behind strength. It is the equivalent of life. The great secret of virtue, virtuality and life, whether temporal or eternal, may be formulated thus. The art of balancing forces so as to keep movement in equilibrium. This motive equilibrium is that of nature itself. Nature, by balancing the decisive forces, produces the physical illness or even the apparent destruction of the poorly balanced man. Mankind rids itself of natural ills by knowing how to escape from the fatal action of the forces through an intelligent use of its liberty. We employ the word fatal here because the unforeseen and misunderstood forces look like necessary fate to the ill-balanced man. The animals live, so to speak, of their own accord and without effort. Man alone has to learn the way to live. Now the science of life is the science of moral balance. The basis of this balance is to reconcile knowledge and religion, reason and feeling, energy and gentleness. Truly invincible strength is strength without violence. Violent anger ensures that one gives oneself up to one's enemies blindly. Homer's heroes, when attacking one another, made a point of hurling mutual insults in an attempt to rouse each other's fury, knowing full well that in all probability, the more infuriated of the two would be conquered. Fiery-tempered Achilles was foredoomed to perish miserably. He was the proudest and bravest of the Greeks, and brought nothing but disasters upon the heads of his compatriots. What took Troy was the prudence and patience of Odysseus, who always held himself in check and never struck unless he was certain of success. Achilles stands for passion, and Odysseus stands for virtue, and we need to bear this in mind before we can understand the high philosophical and moral significance of the Homeric poems. Without doubt, the author of these poems was an initiate of the First Order, and the great secret of practical high magic is all there in the Odyssey. The great secret of magic, the unique and incommunicable arcana, has for its purpose the placing of supernatural power, the service of the human will in some way. To attain such an achievement, it is necessary to know what has to be done to will what is required to dare what must be attempted and to keep silent with discernment. You know, my children, for there is no doubt that I have to reply to children, you know, if you have read my previous works, that I recognize the relative efficacy of spells and herbs and talismans, but these are only minor devices which are linked with the lesser mysteries. I am talking to you now about the great ethical forces and not of the material instruments. You are all of you hiding a secret which is very easily guessed, and it is thus. I have a passion which reason condemns, and I prefer it to reason. That is why I consult an irrational oracle, because it tells me to keep hoping, helps me to trick my conscience, and lulls my heart into a feeling of security. 
The Balasidian Gnostic said that Sophia, the natural wisdom of man, fell in love with herself, as Narcissus did in the fable, looked away from her primary source, and sprang out of that circle traced by the divine light, which they called the Pleroma. All alone in the darkness, she committed sacrileges in order to give birth to the light, and lost her blood like the woman with the issue of blood in the gospel, giving rise to horrible monsters. The most dangerous of all follies is perverted wisdom. The will is the practical realizer. We can do everything which we believe is a reasonable project. Eternity will enter and remain in his memory. He will say to spirit, be matter, and to matter, be spirit. And spirit and matter will obey him. All substance is modified by action. All action is controlled by spirit. All spirit is controlled conformably to the will and all will is decided by some reason. The reality of things is in their reason for existing, and this reason for things is the principle of that which is. Matter is the adjunct of the spirit. Without the spirit, it would have no reason to exist and would not exist. Matter is changed into spirit by the agency of our senses. And this transformation, perceptible only to our souls, is the thing we call pleasure. Pleasure is the sensation of a divine action. Letting it thrive creates life and transforms dead compounds into living substances in the most marvelous manner. Why does nature draw the two sexes together with so much rapture and intoxication? Because she invites them to the great work par excellence, the work of eternal fruitfulness. Woman's beauty is the hymn of motherhood. The only true pleasure, true beauty, and genuine love belongs to the wise who are actually the creators of their own happiness. When they abstain from something, it is to learn how to use it properly. And when they deprive themselves, it is to gain some delight in exchange. His secret lay in possessing the power which creates a persevering will and a wise application of the most sacred laws of nature. Learn to will what God wishes, and everything you want will certainly happen. You must also understand that contraries materialize through contraries. Greed is always poor. Unselfishness is always rich. Pride provokes scorn. Modesty wins praise. Overindulgence in sex kills pleasure. Moderation refines and renews sensual enjoyment. You will get whatever the opposite is of whatever you want unfairly. And you will be repaid a hundred times over for anything you sacrifice to justice. So if you wish to reap on the left hand, sow on the right hand, and meditate on this piece of advice, which looks like a paradox and will give you a hint of one of the greatest secrets of occult philosophy. If you desire to attract, make a vacuum. It works by a physical law which is analogous to a moral law. True enjoyment comes from above. As we have already said, it is desire which attracts. And desire is a bottomless pit. That which is not attracts that which is. Hence those 
who are most unworthy of love are sometimes the most beloved. Fullness goes looking for a vacuum, and the vacuum sucks it in. Animals and wet nurses know this well. You men of genius refrain from having children. Your only legitimate offspring are your books. The art of evocation is the art of provoking an artificial fit of madness in oneself. All visions have the nature of dreams and are illusions of unsound minds. They are clouds from a disordered imagination projected into the astral light. It is we ourselves who appear to ourselves disguised as phantoms, apparitions of the dead, or as demons. Crazed individuals seem to make nature herself delirious within the circle of their attraction and magnetic projection. Mental specialists are well aware of this, but are afraid to admit as such because official science has not yet acknowledged that human beings can be magnets and that these magnets can be maladjusted, out of order. Obedience is the gymnastics of liberty and before one can reach the point of doing always what one wants, it is often necessary to learn to do what one does not want. What pleases us is to be in the service of fantasy. Doing things we do not like is to exercise the reason and will and make them triumph. Contraries assert and confirm themselves by contraries. Looking left when one wants to go right is an act of dissembling and prudence. But to throw some weights into the left hand pan of the scales to make the right hand pan rise is to know the laws of dynamics and equilibrium. It is the resistance which determines the quantity of the force in dynamics, but there is no resistance which cannot be worn down by persistent effort and movement. This is how the mouse gnaws through the rope, and the drops of water pierce the rock. Effort which is renewed daily builds force up and conserves it, even if the action is applied to something which is indifferent in itself, or unreasonable and ridiculous in the bargain. Eat your food without salt for ten or twenty days. Sleep propped on your elbow, sacrifice a black cock at midnight at a crossroads in the middle of a forest. Were the authors of these books trying to make fun of their readers? Were they imparting genuine secrets to them? No, they were not joking, and their information was serious. Their object was to exalt the imagination of their adepts and to make them conscious of a supplementary force which exists as soon as one believes and always grows stronger with persistent effort. Only it can happen by the law of the reaction of contraries that the devil is evoked by unremitting prayer to 